Okay, so um, I'm here to talk about Indigenous voices in healthcare, and I think that's a really kind of appropriate considering we're talking about uh, patient voice and how important it is. So, uh, oh. So moving on very quickly, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the uh, traditional territory of many uh, nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, and the Chippewa, the Hudasan. Hudasan. I know that I was practicing that, and then I still got to <laughs> Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples. And Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. And then I say, why do we do that? One of the reasons we do that is we are all treaty people. Treaties cover almost all of Canada. So each of you live likely in an area that's covered by treaty. And your ancestors signed treaty with First Nations in Canada. So that's why we acknowledge that we continue to work side by side and live in the same, same country. Okay, just a little bit to place myself. Uh, I'm from the Ch uh, Chagastapesim First Nation in Saskatchewan, which is part of Treaty 6. If you know Treaty 6, it's, uh, it takes about one third of Alberta and one third of, of uh, Saskatchewan. And uh, I know you're from Alberta. <laughs> oh, so I just had to say that. Anyways, uh, the treaties, of course, were signed. Uh, as long as the sun shines, the rivers flow, and the, and the grass grows. So for per perpetuity, people who say, why don't we just get rid of them? Well, we can't. Uh, unless one of those things happens, and, and uh, who knows, maybe a big asteroid will come and do it for you. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is that we sign treaties as equals, as you see, uh, two equal uh, people signing there. Okay, very quickly, uh, cultural matters. Um, as we all work in organizations, and often we don't know why they do things the way they do, but that's the way it is, so we just go with it. So I'm going to have you do a mental exercise. Now this one, we've got seven occupations and seven uh, current roles. There's a list there. I want you to list them uh, in terms of who is most valued and who is least valued in our society. I'll give you 30 seconds for that. OK, so here's how I put it. Uh, did anybody get the same or different? Who had the same kind of list? Anybody have different? Any reason why you feel it was different? Yeah, did you put your hand up? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, yeah, good, good. And there's some other reasons too why we would place people in different areas, right? Like some are males and some are females. We kind of, often there's groups that see those different. Um, whether they're retired or whether they're currently employed, whether they're homeless or whether they've got HIV. So often we, we do that. We automatically do instant kind of uh, assessments when we see people. So when we talk about culture does matter, we say, okay, uh, culture, we all, we all have a culture. And sometimes when I do my workshops, people say, I don't have a culture, I'm Canadian. But that's because it's a fishbowl. You're in the fishbowl and you don't see your own culture. Other people see it, but you don't see it. But you do have a culture. Okay, so from our culture, we get our norms and values. Um, these are unconscious rules. It shows us who fits and who doesn't. We know instantly in a room if somebody comes in who they don't quite fit in our system, we notice it right away. And we observe, we make assumptions. Sometimes those are related to some of the biases we have. And we all have biases, even though we do try to uh, minimize and control those. And then uh, it's only bad when those biases turn into negative behaviors and provide ne negative experiences for our patients and families. So that's kind of how culture fits within um, the system. Okay, so again, culture matters. Uh, it's the language that they use. If you're in Canada, you go to a hospital, everything's in English unless you're in Quebec. Um, the way the doctors are trained is in a culturally oriented way. The way the nurses provide care is culturally oriented. And it doesn't often take into account that 
the, the variety of people or the diversity in Canadian that Canada that we have today. So patient-centered care, do we even know who we serve? Do we even know the numbers of people that come into our, our health facilities? Do, you, do we know the number of people who come in as refugees who may have problems beyond uh, medical, um, like uh, beyond strictly medical physical care? Uh, do we know how many Indigenous people visit our organizations? Uh, we don't. Um, is trust and respect shown in the system? Do we know that? Is it demonstrated? How do we ensure that it is? We don't. Is there meaningful engagement with population groups? Probably very little. Um, and that's not, um, that's a way the system is designed. It's not designed to look outside of us. Okay, so then that leads us to cultural safety. Cultural safety really aligns with patient-centered care. So the goal of cultural safety, of course, is for all people to feel respected. So when you come into the hospital, you're respected for who you are, you receive the services that you need. Now when I do talks about talks uh, in large audiences, I get kind of three different responses. One response is people know all they want to know about indigenous people and don't, don't need to know anymore. I've got another group who've learned a lot and they're saying, okay, how do we now make our system more, more uh, inclusive indigenous people? And then we get those people that are already taking action. So we get all those different kinds of people in an audience like this. And I do encourage that as we go along that we um, inform, continue to inform ourselves. Now this is a selection of kind of my favorite uh, books uh, that um, if, you, if you are able to get those books, you will really advance yourself in understanding how Indigenous people got to where they are today and why you see what you see and why there's biases and racism against Indigenous people in Canada. Okay, so where do we start? Uh, how do we learn about, uh, or sorry, learn about Indigenous um, health status, inequalities, learn about trauma and its effects. People un don't really understand what trauma is. When I say that uh, I am a third generation residential school uh, survivor and that four generations of my family went to residential school, people say, mm -hmm. oh, okay, that's, that's fine. But you don't understand some of the trauma that people experience in residential school. People say, well, you know, it happened a long time ago. Well, it didn't happen a long time ago. The last residential school uh, closed in 1996, and if you're 16 years old when, you, when um, the residential school uh, closed, how old would you be now? 39. So we have people uh, who attended residential school still uh, around, like me. Okay, so is your organization and its environment, is it, and the, perhaps the work that you do, are we creating barriers without realizing it? For example, I'll give you an example of, of uh, one of the reasons why this means so much to me, is I worked in a health authority and one of the things that we were, that we had was we had a violence protocol. And the violence protocol tells you how to deal with violent patients. So it, it was something like this. Patient is identified as being angry or unruly. You tell that patient to stop. You give the patient um, a, a second chance, stop or we're going to call security. Then you call security, and then security either restrains him, ties him down, or the patient leaves. So what does that have to do with trauma? Well, trauma is that often when patients come into the hospital, they are elevated in, in their um, anxiety about how they're going to be treated in the, res in the uh, institution, such as Indigenous people. They come into hospitals and they're often triggered by either the Lord's Prayer that comes over the, the, the um, PA system, they're triggered by the hospital bed, they're triggered by a nurse who might say something or a doctor. So when they come in there, they're already anxious and sometimes they have to uh, use substances in order to get them into the door to do what they need to do to get their health looked at and then they're out of there. But what we need to realize is that some of those responses are trauma responses. And if we had our staff trained in how to either de-escalate the trauma 
or to call the uh, Indigenous navigators or to have an elder available in the hospital. Those are kind of things that would be trauma-informed care or having your nursing staff trained and how to apply, how to be practical in terms of um, trauma care. Because I know a lot of uh, hospital staff do take trauma-informed care, but somehow it's disconnected to reality when it happens. And when uh, nursing staff are under stress, they have to get things done, often they, they resort to things like the violence protocol. Okay, and foster relationships. A lot of organizations are just beginning to reach out. Some organizations have a, done tremendous, tremendous amount of work in, in being inclusive indigenous, of indigenous groups like the cancer care uh, people. They've done a lot of work and a lot of people are just uh, working uh, toward that now. Okay, um, the other thing to make, make mention is reconciliation. In Canada, reconciliation is a, big, is a big thing. If we're going to move forward, we have to have a strategy within our systems about reconciliation. Okay, and increase cultural safety, of course. And you know, if you have people trained in cultural safety, that really supports the whole system to be a more culturally safe place for people of all um, diverse backgrounds and, and uh, languages and, and the whole bit. We need to review policies and procedures and guidelines. These are really important. We, knew, we um, need to ensure all frontline staff are trained. We used to have a situation in the emergency room where the daytime staff were very good, they were all trained, but the night nighttime staff who always um, worked nights were not trained and it was the nighttime staff where we got the reports of, of racism and ill treatment of, of uh, indigenous patients. So please ensure all frontline staff are trained. And then develop a system-wide uh, indigenous health strategy with monitoring measures. You've got to be able to monitor your, your progress um, in order to know how you're doing. We measure a lot of things. <laughs> Let's measure how we're doing in terms of cultural safety. Okay, uh, so address discrimination and distrust. One of the things is we don't know how to measure discrimination and distrust. That's very difficult. Like for example, when uh, I was working in uh, the health authority, we had, um, we were working in, in lean projects and I really, I'm really a fan of lean projects because the change that lean brings about enables change in all across the board, and it really helped get the indigenous file and the indigenous issues on the table in order to improve the health system. So I'm really a fan of, of lean. I don't know if I should say that, and, but anyways, I am. Um, so when we're, when we're thinking about that, one of the things that was a big problem in our area was sepsis. And when we looked at the files, people would say, well, of course, it's the poor people who live in the poor areas, the drug addicts, the homeless, those are the people that are, you know, having the worst outcomes for sepsis. But when we dig down deeper and we adjusted for those things, there was something else at play. And we couldn't say that is discrimination, we couldn't say that was um, poor care, we just knew something was up. And that led to an improvement, a new protocol that we would use in treating sepsis patients. So it was a really, good example of how patient feedback can lead to improvements within the health system. Okay, am I getting down to my brass tacks? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so these measures benefit all cultures, of course. The more culturally safe we are, the better. The more value-based we are, the better we are for everyone. Okay, for individual actions, uh, meet people where they're at. Learn more about how culture influences relationships. And we know people various, in various cultures uh, working in the same organization often have cultural conflict and don't even know it. There's cultural conflict uh, or cultural um, tension created when people even have uh, space issues between themselves and another person. So you don't really know until you get some background and start to learn about some of these things. Okay, and then reflect on your own beliefs, experiences, and biases, because we all, all have them. Uh, unlearn racism by understanding historical and contemporary issues. 
And people keep saying, why are we talking about history? Well, history is still permeates the work that we do and the way we look at things. For example, just get, to give you one off the off top, when we think, say that our homes are our castle, where does that come from? That is a historical cultural thinking that comes from way long time ago, but it still permeates. So we have to be rec rec uh, we have to recognize that um, culture is is um, it just doesn't go away if we change the way we do things. It permeates everything. Okay, uh, unlearn, okay, continue to observe your environment and your own behavior with a new culturally self-aware look, uh, self-aware perspective, and observe differences between yourself and others and explore how to bridge those differences. And of course, be pragmatic, make change where you can. And I can't say this enough. You can't just say, okay, we're gonna do this, and we're gonna change this, because the system just often is not ready to make those changes. So you gotta pick and choose where you can start making those changes. Often it's just planting seeds in different areas with people who are doing different things. And that's how you move things forward. If you're a patient advisor, that's how you move things forward. You start laying those seeds and telling people and doing those things, and that will really make a big difference in how the system kind of takes it on. Okay, so I am going to do a plug for the Lunch and Learn tomorrow, Indigenous Issues. Um, I do want to have some time where people can actually ask questions. Sometimes when, a, when we're in an environment like this, people can't ask questions. And I think people ha are dying to ask those questions. And nothing's too... Um, to uh, ignorant, please ask those questions because this is going to be a very safe environment. You can ask me anything. You can ask me my weight and I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you want to know that. <laughs> okay, so anyways, any questions? Maybe two questions if anybody has any. I went through that pretty fast. Thank you so much, Sharon. I, I, I can't thank you enough for joining us today. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is for, for folks who really want to get there and want to review policies and want to do things in this way, I know for myself, I, I just don't even know what I don't know. So how, do I, how can I do that and how do I get guidance to do that? And the second is for people who don't really want to change, but you want to bring them along, um, what's in it for them? It seems to me people only respond for the most part to punishment or rewards. Um, <laughs> um, maybe I'm just cynical, which I am. Um, so, but, so for those of us who want to do it, how do we get some help doing it? For those who don't want to come along, how do we punish or reward them and get them to come along even though they don't want to? Okay. Okay, for the, for the second question, how to bring people along. Uh, a lot of times uh, when you can point out the benefits of a particular thing in terms of this will um, uh, facilitate patient-centered care, for example, and I've used that one quite a lot in, the, in where I was working. If we do this, we will facilitate patient-centered care. So that is generally something that will catch the leaders. It sounds simple. And it is simple, I guess. But when you think about it, people really want to, um, they have their work plans, they have their long-term goals, and you, you need to study what other people have on their long-term goals and their activities. And they say, okay, how can I kind of influence some of those things by um, putting or facilitating that person to be successful to, to do what they want, but also gets me what I need to do. And I do that quite a bit. I don't know if um, Eric can uh, show that, say that, but um, but yeah, I, I do try to move where I can. So, and when you're talking about policies and guidelines, they have a schedule of renewal, like every two years, where they renew policies. And you hear it's through the through the leaders. They hear when these policies are up for renewal. That's when you go in there and you, you look at that policy and you say, okay, this is a policy. How can I make it more patient-centered? How can I can make it more culturally appropriate? And how do I, how do I um, get my input into there? So you have to be part of that uh, process, that, that improvement. Now, if you want to get indigenous 
input into the work you do. That is a little more um, interesting because not only do you have to make, like if you don't have indigenous navigators, an indigenous unit within your, within your service, uh, that is one thing that I think uh, our organizations need to work toward is having an indigenous unit to have that advice right on hand. But also, if you don't have that, then you need to work with the, or, with the uh, indigenous health organizations or the indigenous communities that are nearby your facility and say, and just call, you can just call and say, I'd like to have a meeting where we want to talk about health, we want to get your input on some things, would you be willing to come and talk? And it's a relationship, remember that. You just can't pull them in a room and have them talk and then say bye, see you later, and then walk away. No, this is a relationship. So you might not be able to get much input. First, you have to work toward that because they're not going to trust. They've had hundreds of years of being ignored and pushed around, um, so they're not going to ju all jump on board. I mean, I would, but I've been working in the system for quite a while. But if you want, if you want people, if you want that... Uh, uh, input that, that really means something to the communities, then you need to have those communities in there to talk with you. And I think that's really important. And don't be afraid to ask. doesn't hurt. So, two quick questions, and then we'll wrap up. I was actually going to ask this question for Eric, so glad that you're up there. <laughs> Um, in regards to data collection, when it comes to the indigenous communities, what are you following OCAP, and how are you navigating that whole? Oh, yeah. Well, OCAP, that's a sorry. OCAP is um, was created by the First Nations Information Governance Center, and it means ownership, uh, control, access, and possession. And it basically means that any data collected within the indigenous community is the indigenous communities, and it's not anybody else's. So just wondering how you're navigating that with CIHAI. Well, that's a fantastic question, because uh, we do have an indigenous unit within CAIHAI, and we are looking, because we are an indigenous organization, or sorry, a non-indigenous organization that holds indigenous data, and I say that because we get data from hospitals and other health facilities from all across Canada. So interspersed with that is indigenous data. Very difficult to identify because we don't have a system-wide self-identification, but it can be identified if we do different things to the data. However, CAIHAI is looking at um, OCAP, it's looking at OCAS in terms of Métis, and it's looking at Inuit principles. And our, one of our principles is that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis own their data. So if they own their data, how are we as an organization supposed to look at the data that we know we have in our system, but is not, we, we don't pull it out and we don't use it. So we have that data. So we are working with organizations such as the First Nations Information Governance Center with uh, different uh, Métis Nation, different organizations saying, okay, we are, as we say, getting into this uh, relationship with these organizations. And as an organization ourselves, we have to get a handle on what data we hold. Like when I said there, do we know uh, the patients we serve? For Kaihai, is it do we know the data that we hold? So we have to kind of go into our own stuff and say, okay, where is this indigenous data? Can it be identified? What are the ways it can be identified? Okay, so now what we do? And one of the positive things we've done, nothing's in place yet. We're still kind of working through this, this piece. But one of the things that we said is um, that data, usually uh, if somebody made a request to, for it, we would pull it out and we would give it. Well, we don't do that anymore. We're saying, okay, until we work this out, we have to be very careful how are we, how we as an organization steward that data? We don't own it, they own it. So how do we steward it in the meantime? And of course, we're working with organizations to, um, to ensure that we're doing it in a very respectful way. Did you have anything to add, uh, Eric? Good, okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, just quickly, one is kind of an observation, but you mentioned the navigator role a few times, and, and I totally agree that in a lot of different yeah. cultural contexts, that's so important, yeah. and yet it's not really recognized as an important mm -hmm. role within the healthcare system, and funding structures don't really allow or encourage for that to happen. Mm -hmm. So I guess the question is, what do we do about that, and how do bodies push that to happen more? Um, and the second is just an observation kind of in response to Louise's question about bringing people along, and it's just a continued push for uh, patient and caregiver stories always. Like I find that the most impactful thing is always hearing uh, people's personal stories, and it sometimes wakes up people who otherwise think they're not interested. Yep. Absolutely, and I think it's important that if you do, if you are able to have trainers come in to train every single staff member in your organization, that would be really beneficial because then people start to understand why the situation uh, happens and why the information they have might not be as accurate as they thought it was. Maybe what Uncle Bob said about the neighboring First Nations community isn't that true at all. So just providing people that opportunity to kind of look at things. And we don't, when we do the training, we don't want people to feel guilty about what happened 300 years ago, or 150 years ago, or even 100 years ago. But um, if you do, that's OK with us. No, just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> uh, just kidding. But training, <laughs> I really have to promote training. I think that's really important. Uh, that helps people move ahead. And then your second question was about navigators. When we had to, we had no navigators in the uh, health authority that I was in, we had to do a proposal, and we did it to the, uh, to a, um, uh, what do you call, um, a funding, a charity that provided funds to the health region for a lot of things. So we provide a proposal to them that was refused. So we did it to another one, and that one was approved. So we started to get uh, through that process navigators. But people really see the benefits of having navigators because a lot of, they provide not only a connection to the communities, but a cultural safety piece that, make, that assists patients in the hospital to complete their treatment so they're not stressed out, so they you know, fulfill their, their uh, post-hospital um, treatment. All of those things are really important, and navigators uh, are really, really crucial to that, as well as bringing the stories to the, the system so that we can act on them in, in a better way. I better get out of here now, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs>